And then uh, I need uh, about 16 ushers up here. Uh, actually, if we had four, Carter and Mariah and Jeremy and Josiah, that would be great. So everybody gets one of these. And then this is part one. And then everybody gets one of those. And then when we get to part two, we will... Uh, yeah, we'll do that again. Uh, we've got two more uh, books of the Old Testament to do, and so we'll probably get new notebooks. Uh, people can have a notebook for the New Testament, because I'm assuming everybody's notebook is probably getting, getting full. And so uh, we'll go, uh, we'll, we can get the, the new binders for, the, um, for uh, the New Testament. Take your Bible and go to Zephaniah chapter number one. Uh, I just won. Uh, uh, there's two pages to the first one, and then uh, and then we'll pass out the other one uh, next. Okay. All right, Zephaniah chapter number one. If you have a common man's reference Bible, that's page thirteen sixty five. If, uh, if you have a Skyler, we don't even want you to actually be in here at the moment. I don't know what page that is, brother. If you... Anybody got a Schofield? So if you, if, if you, if you just look around 11, 12, 1300, if you don't know where Zephaniah is, you'll... You'll find it around there. What's that? Fifteen? Well, it's in there somewhere. It depends on the size of the print. That's true. And uh, I'm praising the Lord. Um, there's just, uh, you, you always, when you study the Bible, you're always going to get something. And, 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 and honestly, the minor prophets um, like that we have looked at the last two or three lessons, um, Zephaniah, Haggai, Habakkuk, Nahum, you, you don't hear a lot of preaching from those, ver, those, ver, those books. Um, but there's, there's, um, and, and I understand it's all about prophecy. There's no, uh, in most of these, uh, the last, uh, the last two, uh, Micah and Nahum, uh, or Nahum and Habakkuk, and then, um, and then Zephaniah and, uh, and uh, Haggai, there's no stories in there. So, uh, it, it all has to do with prophecy. Um, but, um, I'll be honest with you, if there's one area, there's a, there's a lot of areas, but if there's one area where I, I'm not the expert, I'm not, I'm not the expert probably in any area, but if there's one where I fall far short, it is the area of prophecy. Um, and uh, there, I thank God for, uh, for men who, uh, who have devoted, uh, some of they've devoted their whole life to uh, study in prophecy, to to bring out the truths that are that uh, we can understand. Uh, one of the one of the blessings, uh, brother Doug Fisher out there in California, he devoted his life studying the uh, to studying the life of David, and um, 
And it was just um, probably the last two or three years uh, before, uh, before he had his uh, uh, heart surgery here. I guess it's probably going on about a year ago now. Um, and by the way, th- some of you that have been to Buffalo know who I'm talking about, Brother Fisher. He, uh, he had that health, health surgery or heart surgery. And, uh, and he's had to resign his church. He just turned the work over a few months ago, probably about three months ago, because of uh, ongoing complications and side effects with that heart surgery. But it wasn't the last two or three years that I heard him where uh, in meetings where he did not preach out of the book or out of the life of David. And, uh, and he preached a lot of uh, um, uh, leadership uh, lessons on leadership, on, on just being a man, on uh, you know taking le- lessons from David's life in the kingdom, applying them to in the church, and so there are men that God has given a unique ability to draw stuff out of things like that, and uh, and so when it comes to prophecy. Uh, you you have uh, you have men like uh, uh, brother Doug Stoffer who is an evangelist. He also pastors down in Florida. Uh, you got brother Grady. Uh, he's he's very good at prophecy, and um, and you have other other men like that. Uh, that uh, you know, there's times where somebody might ask me a question, and uh, and I'm going to say, you know, uh, I'll get back to you, and don't think I studied it out. I called brother Grady and asked him. And uh, or you know texted somebody that I knew uh, that was uh, that was more on that, and um, because they're with doing that, you know the, the the verse in the New Testament about rightly dividing the word of truth. There are things in the Bible. Everything in the Bible is written for us, but not everything in the Bible is written to us. And so, uh, so there's a whole. Um, branch of study uh, stemming from rightly dividing the word of truth. And um, y- y- like the Old Testament law, the, the, the Levitical law, okay? The, Le- the Levitical law was written to the Jewish nation. And, uh, and so uh, aren't you glad today that we don't live by the Levitical law? Amen? Amen especially when it comes to bacon, amen, Brother Bill, uh, and things like that. Um, but, um, and, and so you say, well, it's in the Bible, so, you know, so I'm supposed to live by it. We're supposed to, you're also supposed to rightly divide the word of truth and see what is applicable, you know, and there's all kinds of questions. When was it written? Who wrote it? Who was it written to? Has it, has it ceased since then? Uh, the, the Word of God is not outdated. But you have to know application. You have to know, uh, you have to understand application. You have to understand rightly dividing. And, um, and uh, you know, there's some rightly dividing guy, uh, uh, you know, that... Uh, one of the things that I appreciate about the guys that talk about rightly dividing, uh, and Brother Bob Nagowski is, uh, is excellent with uh, that, uh, that branch of study on rightly dividing, but you have to be careful with some of those guys too because they get into the hyper-dispensational and you know, Old Testament salvation versus New Testament salvation and saved by works versus you know, saved by grace and... and uh, and, uh, and I'll just throw this out there. The people in the Old Testament were saved the same way you and I were saved, by faith. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham didn't do anything that caused him to be counted righteous. He believed. And, uh, and uh, uh, our great uh, Hebrews chapter 11, our Old Testament or New Testament hall of faith, a lot of them saints were in the, most of them were in the Old Testament. Faith, 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 and uh, believing God. And so, uh, so I said all that to say this. I appreciate those that have God has given uh, insight to when it comes to prophecy, explaining it. Um, 
you know, and ain't it amazing when you ask somebody, like you ask a brother Grady and he'll explain it to you and then you think, duh, why didn't I see that? You know, it makes so much sense. Amen. But uh, uh, I'm glad that we all have the Holy Ghost. We all can be enlightened. Amen. That's why we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, so here we are in Zephaniah. Let's read uh, chapter number one. Let's read verses one uh, through six. It says this, The word of the Lord, which came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, the son of Gadaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hizkiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. Now, I'm gonna, I, I, I don't want to jump ahead. Well, I, I did jump ahead. But you notice he, he jumped right in, in verse 2, right into judgment. I mean, there's, there's no background. I'm going to utterly consume everything. All right? And so uh, there was no... Uh, uh, see, the Lord isn't always... He doesn't always do the sandwich philosophy, Right? Set you up, tell you how good you are, tell, then tell you what's wrong, and then end on a positive note. No, he started right off with the negative right here. Uh, verse number three, I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks with the wicked. And I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. I will also stretch out mine hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the name of the uh, uh, Kemarims with the priests and them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops. And them that worship and that swear by the Lord and that swear by Malcolm and them that are turned back from the Lord and those that have not sought the Lord nor inquired for him. By the way, let me just interject here. Verse number five, it says there in them that worship the host of heaven. That is still practiced today. It's called astrology. What's your sign? The signs of the zodiac, horoscopes, and all that. kind. You better stay away from all that stuff. You better stay away from all that stuff. You're messing with things that God's people ought not to be messing with. The Bible says we're supposed to be ignorant concerning those things. And, uh, and, so, uh, and, and you say, well, I just, I just do it for fun. You don't fun around with God with, with uh, things that are spiritual. You, you, you stay away from all of that. And, uh, and so be, ca be careful with that. You say, well, how do I be careful with it? Don't do it. Just avoid it. Just avoid it. All right, so, uh, so here we are. The sur the sur blah, blah, blah. Yeah, easy for me to say. The 36th book of the Old Testament, the author was the prophet Zephaniah, uh, written 635 to 625, note of interest. Uh, Zephaniah mentions the day of the Lord more than any other Old Testament prophet. It will uh, get a little bit more information on that on the, on the next page. Um, and again, as I said, under story highlights, there's no stories in the book. Zephaniah deals almost exclusively with the end time, known as the day of the Lord. Uh, prophecies come true in this time period, uh, 608 B.C. to the future. Uh, key verses, we read chapter 1, verse 2, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 3. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Again, I think I mentioned this in one of the other two uh, uh, books that we mentioned last time. Uh, God always gives a warning. That's why he's a just God. He gives us warning. He gives a fair warning. Yes, we want him to extend mercy. Yes, he's a God of long suffering. And we understand all that, but he always gives us a warning. We, when we have in our hands the complete word of God, we have ignorance is not an excuse. Ignorance is not an excuse. Um, I want to, I can't remember where that was. Let me show you something. Uh, Stacy sent it to me. Uh, today somewhere. Um, good night. How in the world? Okay. 
This is on average of how long it takes uh, to read the Old Testament, okay? Uh, uh, the beginning, uh, 13 hours, 46 minutes. Historical book, 16 hours and 41 minutes. This is average reading speed. Some of us would be more than that, or like me would, or yes, yeah, I would take more than time than that. Some might take less. Uh, other writings, nine hours. The prophets, 15 hours, 35 minutes. The New Testament, uh, the Gospels through Acts, 10 hours, 14 minutes. Uh, epistles through Revelation, 7 hours, 30 minutes. So, if you read the whole Bible, okay, um, it would take you, to read the Bible in two years, it would take six minutes a day. To read the Bible in one year, it would take 12 minutes. To read the Bible in six months, it would be 25 minutes. Three months, 50 minutes. This is a day. And if you wanted to read the Bible in one month, it would take you two and a half hours of reading per day. All right? You say two and a half hours. All right? Uh, on average, users in the USA spend two hours and three minutes on social media every day. On average, uh, people in the USA spend four hours, uh, uh, talking about people that do this, spend four hours watching videos per day. This means that the average American can, com the average American can complete the Bible every month if they replace social media or video intake with scripture reading. We, we don't even realize how much we spend on that stuff. It, it adds up. It adds up. And, uh, and so uh, just thought I would uh, throw that out there. Um, important points about the book. Zephaniah. Uh, Zephaniah prophesied during the reign of Josiah, king of Judah, from 640 to 609 uh, B.C. Josiah was one of the uh, few good kings of Judah. Uh, all, uh, they were mostly wicked kings of Judah. You're talking about the divided kingdom, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Zephaniah talks much about the day of the Lord, uh, the second coming of Jesus Christ. In Zephaniah, the day of the Lord is used to reference the wrath of God that is associated with the second coming and describes a time that is imminent, dreadful, destroying, unavoidable, unavoidable and universal. Listen, when God throws his wrath out, there's nobody going to escape it. All right. Now, if we're saved, thank God we're out of here. Amen. And uh, and so uh, and let me just uh, throw this out there. I was talking uh, with um, uh, Skip and Becky uh, where I was having a conversation the other day. Uh, thank God that if we're saved and the rapture happens, we are out of here. But not everybody is saved. And so when the rapture does happen, uh those people that are alive or going to be born are going to go through the wrath of God. They're going to, they're going to see that. And they're going to experience that. And, uh, and, and uh, the important thing to note is this. The only people, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is where we get this from, the only people that are going to have an opportunity to get saved after the rapture are those that never have heard the true gospel. You say, well, if, I, if I'm not saved, then you know, I can just get saved after the rapture. No, you can't. Not if you've heard the gospel. And, and so you say, well, I watched the Left Behind movie. The Left Behind movie's wrong. Tim LaHaye is wrong on that. And there's, a, there's an independent King James Baptist preacher who also thinks that, and that's Peter Ruckman. Ruckman believes that people can be saved after the rapture that have heard the gospel that just never got... He got a, he's got a whole message on what to do if you miss the rapture. It's heresy. And, uh, you know, how could God be just in allowing people a second chance that have heard the gospel after the rapture? Where would the... Where would the uh, importance be of receiving Christ. There would be no rush 
for people to get saved. Other, I mean, other than death. And so, you know, the younger somebody is, the more they think they're going to live forever. So, you know, you just put it off till later. And so that's why we got to understand the Bible. That's why we got to rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. All right, next page. Zephaniah prophesied uh, during the reign of Josiah. He, he warned of God's judgment on the sin of pride. Go to chapter 2 here. Zephaniah chapter 2. Verse 15, uh, chapter 2, verse 15, this is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly that said in her heart, I am and there is none beside me. How has she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down in? Everyone that passeth by her shall hiss and wag his hand. All right, that's, that's talking about the pride of the enemies of Israel. And then chapter 3, verse number 11. In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, and thou shalt be no more haughty because of my holy mountain. Listen, we, we have... a. a if there's one thing people today are getting colder and colder and colder at, it is that, and that is they don't have shame. They, they don't have, there's no shame for their actions. They, they, they're proud of what they do. That's why they post every wicked thing they do on social media, broadcasting it to the whole world. And, uh, and so um, God hates the sin of pride. Pride is the original sin. That was what got Lucifer lifted up and, and kicked out of heaven was because of his pride. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the historical instrument of correction was Nebuchadnezzar and his army. Uh, and, and we were, uh, did a lot of that with um, Nahum and Habakkuk. But Zephaniah prophesied of the coming judgment upon all of the world kingdoms by the Lord Jesus. Uh, Zephaniah records the clearest reference of the destruction upon the troops of the United Nations or a one world coalition of Muslim and other pagan nations by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you say, well, why, why did we put Muslim in that group? The Muslims from day one have, have and they still believe in this, is world dominance. They want to be the ones in control. And uh, uh, you're there at Zephaniah chapter 3. Look uh, back in verse number 8. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey for my determination. Let me tell you something. If God is determined to do something, it's going to happen, okay? Uh, for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall uh, be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Now, this happened before my time, uh, but that's why when, when the United Nations was formed, Bible preachers cried out against it up to, uh, you know, in, in the time leading up to it, and, uh, and have ever since. Uh, I guess one good thing is they, they kind of did the Lord's work. You know, they'll have everybody gather together so he can pour out his wrath and indignation and, uh, you know, uh, all that. But uh, that's why, uh, that's one of the reasons, <laughs> not trying to be political, but he brought it out. That's why they hated Trump, because Trump was not a one world guy. He wasn't a globalist. The, the, the Clinton dynasty, the Bush dynasty, they're all globalists. Mitch McConnell, he's a globalist. They're all for the, the gathering and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, where you, you just bring everybody together. We're not citizens of America. We're citizens of the world. No, I'm a United States citizen. And, and so uh, it's, 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 it's impossible when you look at things that are going on today, it's impossible to not be political because that's how the devil is bringing it all about. And uh, they don't hate Trump for what he did. They hate Trump for what he exposed 
And that's what he did. He exposed it. And, uh, and he, he didn't do anything. He just brought what was already going on to light. Um, the main doctrine of the book uh, of Zephaniah is the glorious second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is called the day of the Lord. The phrase the day of the Lord is recorded seven times in the book. So, so in three uh, short chapters, uh, we have that phrase, the day of the Lord, uh, mentioned seven times. Then there's a breakdown in there. Uh, chapter one is uh, by itself two divisions of chapter two, two divisions of chapter three. And then uh, some interesting uh, facts uh, about Zephaniah. Um, this was really neat. I, I didn't realize this. Uh, Zephaniah was uh, born during the later part of the reign of King Manasseh. The great, he was the great, great grandson of the godly King Hezekiah. So he was the only prophet of royal descendant. That's not just a pretty interesting uh, tidbit, amen. Uh, Zephaniah was a contemporary of Jeremiah and Habakkuk. Zephaniah was indeed an 11th hour prophet to Judah. If you want to put a little note there next to that one uh, about being an 11th hour prophet, chapter 1, verse 18 uh, is a reference uh, to that. Neither shall their silver nor their gold, neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell uh, in the land. Josiah became king of Judah at age 8. By age 16, his heart had already begun to turn uh, towards God. And there were two sets of reform, or you could say revival, under, uh, uh, under Josiah, uh, he, uh, the first one occurred during the first year of his reign in 628 B.C. Uh, you, a lot of times you see in, in, the, uh, in Chronicles and Kings where it'll talk about a king that was a bad king, but it'll talk about a king that was a good thing, and, a, and it'll list all the things that the good king did, and then the Bible say, how be it he he didn't destroy the high places. And the high places were, were places that were set up in Israel to worship false gods. And, uh, and Josiah uh, tore them down. He, he went the absolute extra mile. Uh, he destroyed the incense altars. Uh, he burned the bones of the false prophets on their altars, broke uh, the carved and molten images in pieces. And then the second reform was six years later in 622. Uh, and that was started under Josiah, but it, be, it came as a result of uh, Hilkiah the priest finding the book of the law in the house of God. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then Hilkiah read... Uh, or it was read to Josiah, and Josiah ran his clothes, and he said, we're not living according to this. And so he made massive changes. Every time I read that about uh, Hilkiah and Josiah, I, I can't help but think, can you imagine if we had a president of the United States today that would have the book read to him and say, we ain't doing this, and make massive reform? He'd be sued for doing something unconstitutional. Let me just tell you something about stuff being unconstitutional. The stuff that was, has been ruled unconstitutional the last 50 years, it wasn't unconstitutional for the 200 years before that. Amen? And I don't care if it's against the Constitution or not. Right is right. Amen. Um, so Zephaniah pronounces God's coming uh, judgment upon the nations that surround Judah, to the west, Philistia, to the east, Moab and Ammon, to the south, Ethiopia, to the north, Assyria. Uh, Jerusalem is characterized by spiritual rebellion, moral treachery, just like we have seen today. Uh, the book of Zephaniah opens with idolatry, wrath, and judgment, and it closes with true worship, rejoicing, and blessing. After God's wrath is poured out, by and by, everything will be fixed. It's all going to be okay. All right, if I could have just uh, two more uh, ushers, hander outers, paper slingers, whatever you want to call yourselves.
Don't matter what you call yourselves, the pay is the same. What's that? Yes, yeah, yeah, we'll double what we gave you last week. All right, Haggai, go over to chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1. We'll also read uh, verses 1 through uh, 6 there uh, in that uh, section. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right. All right, Haggai chapter 1, look in verse number 1. In the second year, and you can pronounce this, however, I've heard people pronounce it Darius or Darius. I think if you had a, if your Bible has the phonetic or the, you know what I'm talking about, the long, the short, I think technically it is Darius. Uh, what's that? Yes. Uh, in the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of uh, Shiltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, it is, is it time for you? O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring, uh, ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye uh, Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Anybody ever feel like that? Um... So the 37th uh, book uh, of the Old Testament is the book of Haggai, uh, bearing the author's name, written around 526 B.C. Uh, Note of interest, and I I think this is pretty good, Haggai is known as one of the few prophets to whom the people of Israel actually listen. Uh, Ain't that amazing? Listen, and we're, we're, we're all that way today, okay? We all have that way. God, you know... It's called disobedience. We're in a bad spot in our life, and we all, we all do this, where even God himself can't tell us what to do. And, uh, and, and so uh, Israel listened uh, to Haggai. Again, there's no, uh, there are no stories in the book, although the rebuilding of the temple is what it's about, and that story is in uh, the book of Ezra. All right, key verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, which we just read. All right, important points about the book. Haggai had wrote from Jerusalem uh, when many people had returned from the Babylonian exile. Those who had returned in hope 15 years earlier were now facing dire struggles. They lacked food and clothing and had been mocked by other nations brutally about rebuilding uh, their temple. And it, again, that's another thing that ain't changed today. You want to do anything for God, people are going to laugh at you. They're, they're going to mock you, all right? And, sa- and sadly, sometimes even in the church, people are, people are going to laugh at you and mock you. Um, Haggai's messages are simple and straightforward. Uh, God tells the people through him, through Haggai, to rebuild the temple first uh, keep them from falling back into errors that had caused the great exile. That's what it was supposed to do. Uh, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi were prophets to the restored remnant after the 70 years captivity of Babylon. They exhorted, instructed, and rebuked the remnant uh, to rebuild the temple and the walls of Jerusalem. And by the way, mention this just a little bit uh, during the meeting, the, the fall meeting with Brother Hardman, is uh, Israel is in big time motion right now to get temple worship restored. 
And that has a lot to do with the end times. And uh, you look in the, you know, the, the five uh, red heifers that were born in Texas that were, that were perfect, uh, that are now uh, in Israel. Uh, and if, if they stay perfect, without spot, without blemish, on their first birthday, uh, then they're going to be used uh, in temple worship. And so you say, well, what does that mean? Well, we know the Lord could come back any second, right? But that's a pretty definitive uh, case for quite possibly we could have less than a year left on this earth until the Lord comes and gets us. That'd be okay. Amen. I mean, I'd be okay if it, you know, uh, if it was before the end of the day today. Amen. Um, uh, the circumstances of the hindrances during the rebuilding are recorded in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, Haggai focused uh, upon the rebuilding of the officials uh, who operate under the color of law. In other words, the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, corruption among officials is what he's talking about there. Haggai exhorted the people to obey God rather than the unlawful uh, bureaucrats. The five messages of the Lord to Haggai are, record, are recorded in two chapters and 38 verses. These brief messages contain the eternal words of the Lord. They are practical for any age. The last message prophesied of the second advent of Jesus Christ. Again, you know, uh, okay, so Haggai is a book of prophecy, right? Well, chapter 1, verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Could you not say that? That would be a verse that we could use today. I mean, don't you think as children of God, we should be constantly considering our ways, constantly considering what we're doing? Um, and there's a lot of words. Uh, uh, the word consider or a form of it is used a lot of times in the, in the New Testament. All right. Uh, the breakdown, uh, chapter 1, is a call to rebuild the Lord's house. Uh, and then chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, a blessing of the, on the new temple. Uh, verses 10 through 19, God corrects the people's behavior. And then uh, chapter 20 to tw or verses 20 to 23, God encourages belief and, and hard work. All right, interesting facts about Haggai. Uh, is known only from this book, mentioned nine times, and two references in the book of Ezra. Uh, which one was it that we just did recently that uh, the only time they were mentioned was in the book that they authored? Um, I believe it was Nahum, but I'm not sure. Uh, Haggai returned from Babylon with the remnant that returned under Zerubbabel and lived in Jerusalem. Uh, when, when he did come back, he lived in Jerusalem. God used two prophets to encourage the people to complete the construction of the temple, Haggai, Zechariah. Uh, Darius was king of Persia during the work of Haggai and Zechariah. At the time of the book, now I thought, I thought this was just interesting as far as a timeline. At the time of the book of Haggai, it had been 16 years since the initial work of rebuilding uh, the temple had begun. And so the, the, the construction timeline is listed there. Uh, the work began in 536 B.C., in 534, the work ceased for 14 years. So they worked two years, and then it ceased for 14 years. And then it resumed in 520 B.C. Uh, and was completed four years later. So uh, the actual work of rebuilding the temple was six years over a 20-year period. And, uh, and so... Um, uh, and, and by the way, that Temple Mount over there in Jerusalem is, is the hot spot of prophecy today. Christianity lays claim to it, the Jews lay claim to it, and the Muslims lay claim to it. And, uh, and so uh, God's going to sort all that out, amen? Don't you worry about it. He has not lost the records, amen? All right, uh, one more time, if I could have some faithful assistance, hand out our prayer.